Okay. Coming online, everybody. And let's get started here. Three, two, one. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my studio here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, I'm just looking at the framing of here. Maybe my head's a little bit uh, top, being cropped out of the top of the picture. That's, uh, that's what you get when you're trying to set all this up all by yourself. Um, let's see if we can get one, another angle. Whoa, look how bright that is. Okay, so not the optimal um, settings here. Maybe I'll crouch down <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, again, this is a good um, moment just to mention this right off the top. Um, is having your head cut off for just a little bit of the hair can be a little bit of annoying in pictures. Ideally, this frame would be a little bit lower around here or something, right? <laughs> Um, okay, so welcome to my studio here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. My name is Michael Markowski, and I'm going to be your photography instructor for the next hour or so. And I'm super excited for today's uh, lesson and lessons and things we're going to do today because today we're really going to be taking control over your camera. Uh, most of the time when people, let me grab a camera here, are... Uh, let's see, we'll go here. Most of the time, just push all this out of the way. Uh, when people, um, if you can, that camera back there could go up just a little bit. It's going to be it's almost impossible to do. You'd have to get a little piece of, uh, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll thank you. That's just my wife trying as best as possible to help me, but, um, so most of the time when people are uh, taking photographs they are taking photos in the auto setting and we talked about this last week and i think a lot of people are on the green setting of your camera right the fully auto setting and then i suggested you flip it to the next mode which is the one with the lightning bolt crossed out maybe i'll get even higher up here Right, so you see where it's sitting right now, right? The lightning bolt is crossed out. This is the one that everyone is usually on. And then this is the one with the lightning bolt, right? And when you're, look at my head out of the way. Um, when you're here, you, you're gonna take pretty good pictures. 60% of the time, you might get the photos you want to take. But as you can see, there's a whole bunch more modes on your camera. And this is the mode dial, by the way. And this allows you to select different modes. So first of all, we've just talked about these two, um, oops, uh, the, these two auto modes, right? So there's also a few other auto modes on your camera. And you'll see these ones, there's one here, um, with a person's face on it, like a profile. And that is another auto mode, which tells the camera, I, I still want you to do absolutely everything. I want you to, to uh, adjust all the exposure yourself, but I'm just giving you a little bit more context for the photograph I'm taking right now. This next button here is saying, I'm trying to take a picture of somebody's face. And I might be a little bit closer. I'm trying to take a portrait. So the camera's gonna do all of the computations for you. The next one here, and, and some cameras have lots of these. Some of them only have one or two, and some have different icons. This is the Canon camera, and I'll show you really quickly on the, on the uh, Nikon after this. Um, then we have one with a landscape, like a cloud passing behind a, a, a mountain, I think. And that one is to tell the camera, hey, listen, I still want you to do everything for me. But just so you know, I'm trying to take pictures of uh, a landscape. You know, I'm a, a forest or I'm uh, 
standing on a mountain or going hiking and I'm looking in this nice big deep valley and I want to be able to see the clouds and the mountains in the far on the other side of the valley can you take that photo and so the computer inside the camera because there's a computer in here right it goes oh okay I'll, I'll adjust the settings to make that happen and then there's another one of a flower and that one's again fully automatic you're telling the camera hey I still want you to do everything but I want you to try to take I'm taking a picture of a flower so I really want to get up close to something you know I want to be able to have a, a flower you know a arms length or less away from the camera so help me take that kind of photograph and then on here there's another one for uh, a person running right so you're now telling your camera I still want you to do everything for me but this time I'm taking pictures of my children playing soccer or um, I'm watching a, a bicycle race and I want you to help me take photographs that way and so again the camera says okay I'll, I'll I can help take that type of photograph and I'll ex I'm not going to go into what those settings are right now because it probably won't make any sense to most of you watching if you're watching this video right now, right? So those settings there are, uh, and let's I'll just quickly show you here on the Nikon. And most 99% of camera manufacturers have a similar thing. So here's the Nikon. Right, so we started here. This is what more most people are on the green button here that says, do everything for me, right? Then I said, switch it to the one with the lightning bolt crossed out. If, if nothing else, right, that's gonna disable the flash. So it's still taking all of the pictures in automatic for you. Then the next one here is, what is that? Okay, so that's the person. You're taking a portrait and then we've got I think this, I don't know what that is. I think that's a landscape again. And then we've got, maybe that's little children, I think, setting. <laughs> and then a person running, flower. And then there's there are some other kind of slightly customized modes um, there. So those are the, the, the main th uh, like five, six fully automatic modes, right? So you, are doing uh, all you're basically doing when you're using any of these modes is pointing the camera at something all right so your lens cap is off you point your camera at something and then you're pressing the shutter release the button that takes the pictures so you aren't adjusting any other dials the computer inside the camera is doing all of that for you okay so that's all of that is is really important for you to understand right off the top is you have your your basic first two ones here the, the green one and the lightning bolt they are super generic settings right they're they're for everything like you're basically giving no information to the camera except here i turn it on and i'm pointing at something take the picture get the best result you can and that's why if you're using these two settings you're really rolling the dice you're hoping that the the setting you're in to take your picture is kind of falls within the range of the of what people programmed your camera to be able to do right now that's why the other ones are just kind of helping give more context to your photograph okay does that make sense so far um, so let's now uh, let's dive into some of the more complicated ones here so you'll then see you have like a program mode or a P and that's for, so now we're going into the semi-automatic modes. And you know, I, I often don't even explain these at this point yet because um, we're gonna talk, this we got like shutter priority, aperture priority, and then manual where we're going to go by the end today. Um, or even sooner really um, but these ones here people don't even you may not even know what aperture is or shutter is so shutter priority it's like what on earth are we even talking about why did, why are you even mentioning that right now so uh, it'll be easier for us to learn about what the, the the various settings are in our camera before we then go back to, to that so we'll come back on on those okay so our goal is to get to the manual 
today. We're going to kind of jump, dive into the M side of your camera. Now, let me see. This camera, do we have a... I'm going to need to put a new battery in here. So, I hope everyone's got your charged up batteries. It's uh, I, I, one of the things that I mentioned last week of that is really important. That Well, I think it's really important is to have an extra battery. So every camera I own, I have at least uh, two extra batteries. So that way, if I'm out somewhere, I, I'm not stuck in the lurch and then sitting in a coffee shop on a beautiful sunny day, desperately waiting for my camera battery to charge. Because most camera b batteries take roughly two hours, 90 minutes, an hour and a half or so, for the battery to charge. So you don't want to be waiting for this thing to charge and missing out on a good opportunity to take some good photographs. So, um, what we're going to do, this is, I'm going to show you, I should have like a little title that comes across the screen that uh, shows you th this exercise that, uh, I don't even know where I first learned this. Um, I'll have to, that's, that's, I, I never really thought about that, but let's, um, I'm going to show you this, this photo technique. So let's just first, we, let's, we've got our camera and I hope you've got your camera with you because it'll be really helpful for you to follow along. Now it's going to be different for every make and model of camera. Um, you may have a Canon camera, but you might have a Canon T4 or a Canon T7i or a 6D Mark II, or there's all sorts of different Canon cameras. And then there's, if maybe you have a Nikon camera, right? And then there's there's literally about a hundred different models of Nikon cameras, and Fuji, and Panasonic, and Pentax, Olympics. So that's why having your manual is helpful. I'm gonna teach you the fundamentals of photography, but I can't really teach you the fundamentals of how to use your camera, because I don't really know what you have. But having said that, all of the basic principles of photography apply to every single photographic device that exists, including your iPhone or Android or whatever. Okay, so this technique involves taking a photograph in an auto mode, looking at the settings that your camera took the photograph in, and then we're gonna reproduce those same settings in manual. So that's going to help get you into the ballpark. So uh, you'll know what the camera thinks the photograph should be, should have, uh, you'll, you'll see what the camera thinks the settings should be when you take the photograph. And then when you replicate it in manual, then you can adjust slightly to make it brighter or darker or anything. Um, and so uh, just to see a few comments coming in here. Um, uh, Sarah, thank you so much for, for commenting right off the bat. Yes, I hope you took some good photos this weekend. If you have good photos, you could um, tweet them at me right now, and then maybe we'll, at the very end, we'll get to, or we'll, we'll get to some of the photos maybe even right after this. We'll see. We'll see how, how we go here um, in terms of time. Uh, so, And then Sam says, can you use your phone for these lessons? Um, the first two for sure. The, what we're about to do now you can there are some apps that you can adjust all of the main settings in your iphone and android uh and but it'll be a little bit tricky if, if you don't know how to use some of those like lightroom would be the the, uh, the probably the best one for your your phone anyway so i'm going to jump into here so what we're going to do is we've got our camera in hand we've turned it to one of the auto settings and this doesn't really matter which auto setting, but for our purpose, the one with the lightning bolt crossed out. That is the go-to auto setting, I think. So I've got my camera and I'm gonna turn it on, right? So the, the, the camera is, is on. You can even see it says flash off, the flash is disabled. Okay. So now, oh, and I want to, even before, I wanna make sure my uh, focus is on automatic or AF or a, a, uh, AM rather than M for manual, right? And I am going to, got my lens cap off, let's just point the camera at something and take a picture, right? So, um, 
my gosh, it's not going to work out very well. I'll just show it on here. In a couple days, I'll have the my a new rig set up here. Well, I'll have my an actual camera, not my iPhone, taking pictures, and I'll be able to adjust it. But for our per mm, gosh, this is this is going to be tricky to do this anyway. Uh, well, okay, so. If we're, we've just taken a photograph, the photo on my camera here actually looks good. So I'm happy with this photograph. But what I want to do is I want to be able to find out what the camera used for the settings on this picture. Oh, uh, Yannick says he sent me some photos on Instagram. Okay. So to find out, so right now my screen, again, it's, this is not ideal because you can't really see properly. I wonder if I... Darken that one. Hmm. Uh, okay. So, what I want to do is I want to see the information on here. And on a Canon camera, you could, if you're, so, if I press the play button, so I see the last photo I've taken. On the Canon camera, I can press info. And some numbers and stuff show up on the screen. Uh, so, I don't know if this will be able to be captured up here. So, you can see, I'll move this out of the way. In this setting, there's three main things that I want to, and I'm, I would even, I'm going to grab a piece of paper and a pencil, and I'm going to write some this information down here. So come on, get back up there. So this, your computer is going to go to sleep every once in a while here, just to preserve the battery. So the first thing in the top left corner on the Canon here, it says um, 1 over 40. And then I see this thing that says 4.5. And then I see another thing that says ISO 3200. So, oops, I'm just going to draw this here. So, this first setting here, when it said 1 over 40, that's my shutter speed. This next one here is called my aperture, and it's often kind of marked with a little F. And the next one here is ISO. So those are the, f the main three things. So if you're looking at a photograph you took, and let's just do, t point it at something else. Um, something totally different. Right? Again, I can see, if I press play, I can see different, mm, well, actually the numbers are fairly similar. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so one over 40 f4.5 and then this time the iso changed to 1600 1600 i don't know if you can quite see that very well but uh so that's so both two settings stayed the same and one changed slightly at this point it doesn't matter that you understand what those settings are um let me see this is my wife's camera oh i didn't realize a, this compartment was broken off on the bottom how do you put the battery in this bad boy here hmm well <laughs> i don't think this is going to oh maybe i don't even know if there's an sd card in this camera oh there is so here's my wife's uh nikon camera and I'm going to turn it to the auto setting. And let's take a picture. And then I'm going to press play to look at the most recent picture. And then on the Nikon to look at, to get that information, the exif data, um, inf or exif, it's like exit uh, information. I press down on my camera on the the, the D-pad that's called right, and then we get a bunch of info shows up here. Sorry, it's super awkward trying to hold this. 
battery in. Um, come on, okay. So, what I need is a little tripod where everything stays the same all the time. So for this photo, what I would write down is one over 60, that's my shutter speed. See here it says F2, oh, come on, come back up. F2, which is my aperture, and ISO 400. So those would be the settings for this camera, for that particular photo, right? So um, if sometimes I think usually when you get uh, incidentally, you're, if you have a Nikon camera, I noticed this, if you have just got it and you haven't ever tried to find that information, you've actually got to go into the menu and let me see if I can remember where to find that. You would go up to play and then you go to, I think it's, I think it's display mode. Detailed photo info, and then you get all this. And so you'd have to click like data. Let's just click all of this so you can see. Okay, let's. I think that saved it all. Um, and then once you've done that, then you can tap the bottom here and it, that information, will, you'll be able to cycle through. So you notice if I keep on pushing, all that information disappears, right? So I'd write all that information down. There is a lot of information that your camera will um, save on every photo, including usually the, like the length of the lens, like your, what kind of lens you're using. Um, like you could have, if your camera can do GPS, it'll tell you where on earth you were in the time of day. You can even program it to put in your own um, custom like copyright information. And in uh, my classes often, I'll send out, a, I can't, uh, maybe I'll put the link in below, but there's a few articles of people who've had their camera stolen and then they notice some of their own pictures that they took before their camera was stolen appear up on the web. And they're like, oh, that's funny. That's, that's my camera. And those are pictures that I, I lost. And then they, you can kind of look at that photograph and find the information, find your copyright. And for, anyway, they caught the guy red handed because this guy was uploading photos from a camera that he stole and claiming them as his photographs. And meanwhile, in the, the information, if you search inside the file, you could see that it was belonged to somebody else. So cops knock at the door, say, hey, you just, uh, you're, we caught you right handed because you're, you're using somebody else's cameras. Every photograph has that person's information on there anyway. Um, okay, so the, once we know what this information is, I'll come back to, to here. So we've got one over 40, 4.5, 3,200. These are, this is the most important information of all. Uh, when we know that information, we can recreate it, not only in your camera, but using somebody else's camera. Uh, let me see. I want to bring up, uh, where's our photography class? So I'm going to bring up the handout. And we're just going to kind of take a quick look at this. Uh, this image is just going to terrify some people. Well, you know what, maybe I'll hold off on showing you how to, on, on uh, no, I will. <laughs> Let me see. I'm just going to because this is, can be a little bit scary for people. So um, we're gonna just take our time and I'll explain all of this nice and carefully. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Sorry, just gonna get everything sorted here. Okay, so on the screen now, is you can see what is called the exposure triangle. And on that exposure triangle, you have, uh, like any triangle, three sides. And there's different ways of drawing this diagram. Um, 
This is one that I've kind of cobbled together from a few different sources on the web. Um, kind of photoshopped it, Frankenstein, to try to make it as clear as possible. Excuse me. So on one side of the exposure triangle, you see there's the shutter speed. On the left side, on the right side is aperture, and on the bottom is ISO. It doesn't matter what is on one side. There's, there's nothing saying that, uh, that the ISO couldn't be on the right side or the left side. That, that is irrelevant. It's just a diagram to try to explain this concept. And I, I should also say that photographers, photography is one of those things that is really, uh, it, it's a, it technically is really complicated to understand. And then once you get it, it all snaps into focus and it all makes sense. So um, photographers like myself, we're always trying to think of like, what is an, an analogy and an, an analogy that uh, ex can explain this um, initially complicated concept in the most simple terms possible. So uh, with the, exp this is one way that, that people have, have, in, have come up with to help explain it. So we have the exposure triangle, the three different sides. And if we come back to this image here, we see the same thing. We have shutter speed, aperture, ISO. I've just written it like this, and excuse this, I was trying to draw these lines with one hand, so that's why there's that weird. <laughs> uh, so, and this was F 4.5. So these three parts of the exposure control how much light the camera um, at, um, let into the sensor of the camera and that controls the exposure how what the image looked like really so by adjusting those three settings and really those are the only main three settings that you need to know that's why what's super frustrating about these new fa fancy digital cameras is is that they have all these buttons and knobs and dials and like switches you know Oh, you know, these little openings on the side. It's like, what on earth does all of this stuff do? What, do I actually need any of it? The, the, and the answer is, it's not so straightforward. I would say, um, you know, if, if you know how to use your camera, all of these buttons and everything are really helpful because they help you customize things and, and maybe make yourself a little more efficient if you're doing a lot of photography. Um, but for beginners, it's totally overwhelming. And that's why learning on um, a analog film camera, you know, like the one you used to put film in and wind it, right? And, and you go take it to a place to get the, the roll to get developed. Those cameras were much, much more simple. And it was much easier to learn these basic concepts. Okay. So... Um, let's just take another photograph because I want you to get used to, to writing these numbers down as, as quickly as, as possible. So uh, I'm going to take a picture of something a little bit. Uh, let's see if that made any difference. So I just pointed it up above. Come on, let's zoom in. And again, I've got <laughs> fairly similar because... I've got a lot of light blasting into this area here, so, and then what we would say is F 4.0, and then ISO 1600. So I wrote this information down, All right? And so this, this is an F, right? You can you can write it in different ways. So, <coughs> excuse me. I I usually get. Uh, allergies during spring and my daughter and I were out walking around looking at flowers and my nose just started to run. I haven't had a chance to take any you know, uh, Claritin or whatever. Okay, so these, I want to ref I want to be able to reproduce these settings in my camera. So if you have your instruction manual, you want to have that kind of handy because some of these settings are, are relatively straightforward to find. Let's say you have a much smaller camera, like something like this. Well, 
adjusting these three settings, you're going to have to go into the menu of your camera. And then, you know, some of these cameras have menus with a hundred or more items. So going through that can be really tricky. So if you've got your, this is my manual for this camera, uh, but I've used it many times. I don't need it, but, um, uh, so let's, if we turn our camera back on and let's right now, you may notice even my camera says on, but nothing's happening to get your camera to wake back up when it's actually on, just tap your shutter. Well, you, if you press too hard, it takes a picture. That's all right. I can delete that photo really easily. So what I want to do is I'm going to turn my camera and this is where it gets scary because we're going to jump in off the deep end and I'm going to go all the way to manual, right? So I go all the way to the M button on my camera and just going to move. <laughs> yes, that was a big sneeze. Um, okay, so if I'm here in manual, now I want to, to find the controls that make control these different settings. So the first one that we're going to control is our shutter speed. And the, the main reason why I say it's the first one that I'm going to adjust is it's usually the default one. Every camera, most cameras anyway, except maybe those like a little tiny point and shoot, has your main mode dial on the top, right, to switch to manual. And then you, you'll have this little thing that clicks Right? And that might be on the front, it could be on the back, there could be a number of different places. We call this your command dial, right? And we want to turn that. And when I turn that, it will, it will probably go infinitely in any direction. But I'll notice some numbers changing. And that, and you can see on, on my camera here, when I turn turn that button, you see these things where it says bulb, right? And if I keep on turning, it won't go any further. So bulb on one side, and I'll explain what that is shortly. And if I crank, keep on going all the way to the other side, it says one over 4,000, one four thousandths, right? What that means, just get a little bit over here. So what that is, this is my fastest shutter speed on this camera. My camera can now take a picture at one four thousandth of a second, right? So you can imagine there, are, in this instance, let's say there are, if I could, if the camera was capable of taking them fast enough, I could take four thousand photographs in one second, right? That's how fast that shutter speed is. It's it's literally faster than the blink of an eye, right? So that is, you know, one four thousandth of a second, that's for taking photographs of like a, a basketball player jumping in the air, Michael Jordan slamming the, the ball into the hoop, right? If anybody's watching that uh, last chance on Netflix. <laughs> um, so you want to be able to slow the action. You know, if you've seen somebody on the Discovery Channel and they shoot a, a bullet through an apple and, you, and it goes down really slow so we see the, the apple exploding as the bullet's going through it, that's even faster than one four thousandths. You know, that's like one, you know, one hundredth of a second. Right at the Olympics, you know, the to find out who crossed the finish line faster, they have super fast shutter speeds. Okay, so then if I if I start going down here, you see these numbers start changing: one one thousandth of a second, one eight hundred, <laughs> uh, one five hundredth of a second. I keep on going: one two hundredth, one one hundredth of a second, one sixtieth of a second. Now I'll just say in here when we get to this area of one sixtieth of a second, or you see one fortieth of a second that I wrote down. This is important to remember this area because as I go slower than this, then we get into a danger of, of blur starting to happen in the camera. So I keep on going here, one and one twentieth of a second, right? Here we go all the way to one second, right? So 
actually, so if I, you can even just hear, let, um, I'm gonna go all the way back up to this fast shutter speed and let's just hear, all right? So that's a fast shutter speed, all right? And then as I go up here to one second and you can tell one second, you know, it has like the quotation marks on the side. That's, now we know we're in the seconds here. So if I take this picture now, So did you hear the difference? That was, it was open, literally longer than um, before. Now we go up five seconds, six seconds. So uh, let's just take an eight second photograph here. Okay, so <laughs> that meant that the camera was open, absorbing light for eight seconds. Right, so um, in in this instance, we can even just take a quick. Um, well, actually, we won't, we won't do it because the settings are all off right now. But we're, if we keep on going, we go up to twenty second long exposure, thirty second long exposure, and then bulb. Bulb means it's going to be open for as long as you want until you turn it off. Right until you until you. So if I if I, well, right now, if I hold it, it's it's open. You see how long it's counting here? Three, four, five. So if I held my finger here for another hour, it would still take pictures. If I held it here, put a piece of tape on there, or went to sleep, it would be taking a pho one photograph all night long until the battery ran out, right? So I take my finger off, and now the photo has stopped. Take, or the exposure is, is complete. <laughs> So I wrote down here 1 40th of a second. So I'm going to crank my camera all the way till I get to 1 40th of a second. So you see that? There's 1 40th of a second. There we go. We've got one third of the exposure triangle uh, of the three most important settings for your camera. One of them is done. One of them's been set. All right. Now let's go to the next one here. So the next one here is aperture. And we want to set the aperture. So um, I'll just show you on, on the, the Canon here. What we're going to look for is a button. Uh, do you see the one I'm pointing at here? It says AV and then it's got a plus and minus in it, right? And if I tap that, do you see how those little arrows went from the, I'll take my finger off to one for you. I'm gonna tap it again. And you see how they go to F5. Take my finger off again. So what I can do, I'm just gonna try to move this out of the way so you can see what I'm up to. So if I hold that button down, tap with my thumb, and then turn the dial, the same dial I used to turn the shutter speed, now instead of turning the shutter speed, it's turning the aperture. Right now it goes all the way up to F25 on this camera. There are, there are, shutter, are apertures that are, are higher than that. But let's say we cr keep on cranking, we go all the way to the other side. And now I go to F4.0, right? And I take my thumb off, and now if I turn it, it's gonna change the shutter speed again, All right? So I have to hold that down in order to change the aperture. Does that make sense? So now I've adjusted my shutter speed and my aperture. I've got two sides of the exposure triangle completed. Okay, so the final side to the exposure triangle is ISO. And I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna explain what some of this stuff is here. Well, maybe, you, maybe I'll, I'll go into more detail as to what uh, these settings actually mean next class, uh, because 
At this point, it's not really, you don't really need to know what shutter speed, aperture, ISO are, or what they're doing, because um, we're going to start, we're going to go nice and gentle here. I don't want to overwhelm you. So let's now set our ISO. We said we wanted a 1600 ISO. Now, when I look at my camera, my camera is set at ISO 1600 just by coincidence from the last time I used my camera. So I want to change my ISO and depending on your camera, so some Canon cameras actually have a dedicated button for ISO actually on the camera itself. So you see this here, it says ISO, right? I can press this button. So I'm, if I turn my camera here and I look at it and I press that ISO button, you see how things change? And now I can scroll through this, and here's my different ISO settings. All right, so I get to 1600, or I could press 200. And if I if I wanted 200, I'd say set, and now my ISO is set to 200. But I wanted 1600, right? That's what I saw in my photograph. So I'm going to set it to 16, and then press set. So now my settings in the manual mode are um, identical to the settings of the auto um, functions of the camera when it took that last photograph. So if I took another photograph, I would recreate those settings exactly as they are. So let's start this all over from scratch again. So now let's try, let's, uh, we're gonna take a photograph, we're gonna take two photographs, one in automatic and another in manual after we've replicated those settings. So let's uh, look for something with maybe a different kind of light, like something a little bit darker. Everything's really well lit in here. So I'm actually I'm just gonna point my camera underneath the table where it's a little bit darker. And so I took that picture in auto mode again, right? So auto mode, and then I'm gonna press play and I'm going to look at the settings and I'm going to write this information down. So <laughs> trying to hold this up while uh, okay so now we're at 1 15th of a second. I see that right there. And then I see 4.0, F 4.0. And then, oh, it's gone to sleep for a second. I just tap the, the play button again. And then I'm at ISO 6400. Okay. So I'm going to replicate those settings in my camera. I'm going to turn my camera from the auto mode to manual, all right, so I'm back in the M setting. And then I wanna replicate this, it says 1 15th of a second. So I've adjusted to 1 15th in shutter speed. I'm gonna press down the AV or uh, aperture value as Canon calls it. And then I'm gonna go to F4. So I was actually already on F4 from the last photograph, so that's okay, I'm just gonna leave it there or I can move away just so you can see that I can adjust it. And then the ISO on the Canon, I press down on the button, go to 6400 and boom. Now I'm gonna point my camera at roughly the same thing I previously took a picture of. And then if I press play, and I'm just gonna hide some of all that information and if I look at these two photographs, it's not showing up here on, on this uh, iPhone above, but these photos are virtually identical, right? These are two, this photograph was taken in auto mode and this photograph was taken in manual mode. So um, that, so this is the, the super quick and dirty way to, um, 
Because if I just said to you, let's take a picture in manual and, and start changing these settings and dials, it's like, why why one fortieth of a second and not one four thousandth of a second? Or why F4 or not 22? Or like, I don't even know where to begin, right? It's overwhelming. So using this method, it it tells me the what the computer thinks is ideal right so it's like okay and then so if i look at the picture and um and i'm not happy with it because it's too bright or too dark well then i can and okay so let me let me, re, let me start that again so let's say i i'm in automatic right and i take a picture and then and i look at it like oh that's not what I wanted. It's too dark. Ugh. This camera's a piece of junk. Why did I pay $500 or $5,000 for it? Like, it can't... This auto mode sucks. It can't take the photos I want. That's not really... Uh, it's kind of unfair to the camera. Uh, it's trying to do its best, but it can only uh, do so much without your guidance, right? So, if you took that photograph and you're like, ah, it's too dark then you could find what the settings are, replicate them in manual, take the photograph again, which should be identical, right? And then you can adjust one of these settings to make it brighter or darker, right? Because each of these settings will make the picture brighter or darker. They do other things as well. We're not going to get uh, into it right now because... Um, uh, just not enough time you know I, ideally what i want to do is in the next uh 10 minutes move on and, and show you some photos i took and photographs uh that some other people have taken uh and just give a kind of a little um review of them and, and tell you what i think and how maybe they could be better so if that's something you're interested in doing you could send them to me right now on twitter uh, markowski art um and the link directly to it is in the description below here uh, on YouTube, which is probably where you're watching this. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, what I, so the homework that I'm going to give you for today is to, let me bring this in here. So your homework and it's, it seems relatively straightforward and simple. Um, and if that's if it's really simple, that's a good thing. Um, not everybody... I, usually when I teach these classes, people have a hard time um, getting this at first. So for some of you, this is going to be a, a big challenge. So what I want you to do is just take your camera and you can do this while you're sitting on the couch watching netflix or um while you're sitting on the patio or sitting at a bus stop right like just take your camera out turn it to automatic take a photograph then look at the information on your camera write it down is probably the easiest it, if you try to remember and memorize all this it's it's um, it's trick. It's really tricky at first because it's all a bunch of numbers and what does all this mean? Um, so we, we, then we recreate it in manual. You want to be able to do this as often as possible. The more that you can do this and the easier it gets, the less likely that you're going to ever need to go back to the auto settings of your camera to begin with, right? Because the more comfortable you get with making these adjustments, the more you'll just be able to launch right into taking those photographs. So I want you to take as many photographs as possible in automatic, finding the, the, this information of the shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, recreating them in manual and taking, reproducing that photograph. Now, um, while I'm here, I should mention a few things uh, that kind of complicate it a little bit. And if, I'm sure I'll, I'll never be able to recreate it here for your purposes, or our purposes. Um, but there are times where, for instance, you may get something like, let's I could have the same sort of thing here, but my ISO uh, is, let's, let's just see how I can show you on your camera, on this camera. 
So let's say I took a photograph and the ISO said something like uh, 940. Right, and you're like, okay, 940, I wrote that nine. And then you go to adjust your ISO and you look, I got, whoa, wait a minute, I got 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, like, I don't have a 940, what am I supposed to do here? Okay, so that that is where some of this runs into a little bit of a problem. And that's because your camera in auto mode is kind of cheating a little bit. It's allowing its self access to a little bit finer customization than it's allowing you when you are using the camera in manual. Um, why does that happen? Well, again, it's a little bit of a marketing thing. Um, if you were to buy a much larger, usually, well, it's more expensive camera, professional grade camera, then you're gonna have access to all those fine little gradients of, uh, um, of different setting ISO settings, and even potentially in aperture settings and shutter speed. You'll be able to just fine tune it a little bit more. In these kind of cheaper entry level cameras, they, they don't give you as many options, right? So that can be frustrating for some people. So what do you do? because there's gonna be somebody out there who's going to run into this problem. If I've, let's say I have that 940, but I, I've got 800 and then 1600, my recommendation would be to always go to the lower ISO setting, when, if possible, right? So that, um, cause we'll talk about why, like what, what ISO is in next class on Wednesday. Um, so if I had that same problem, I would choose to go to 800. Now, that's gonna mean the picture is gonna be a little bit different. The exposure in this case would be a little bit darker, right? So then um, you would want to adjust your shutter speed or aperture to let more light in. And again, we're starting to kind of go a little bit further down the road than might feel comfortable. If you get into that situation for our purpose right now, just kind of ignore it. Your photo, you just know your photograph's gonna be a little bit darker. Another possible difference that you may notice is sometimes people, re they take the picture in auto, find the settings, reproduce it in manual, and they notice, well, oh, my pictures are all red or bluish. What, what's going on? The colors change. Like the, the, the amount of light is the same, but the color has changed. What, what's gone wrong? Well, in all likelihood, that is your auto white balance, or the white balance is not on automatic, or it's different. Now, uh, I'll just show you here on the Canon, and I'll do a quick review of some of what I've just talked about in on the Nikon here in just a moment. Um, so to change the white balance on this Canon camera, there's two ways I could do it. I could touch the WB here, right? And it might have been on one of these other settings. I'm just gonna put it right back to auto white balance. Even though I'm in manual mode, I'm gonna put it back to auto white balance. And that's gonna get the, the color should be consistent with the, with the auto settings in the auto mode. Okay. Um, so that's the Canon. I'll just uh, quickly show how to adjust these settings on the Nikon. So let's say I'm gonna take a picture. Uh, let's, let's do another darker photograph again. Where can I take? Um, Okay, so in this instance, I gotta, this, <laughs> I gotta have to put some tape here. The battery wants to fall out of this camera. So I'm just gonna write it down really quickly and then I'm gonna show you. Now, Canon and Nikon occupy somewhere like about 70% of the camera market. So for me to show you how to use the Canon and Nikon, or I'm, covering most of people. Now I shoot on Fuji mostly these days, so which is a totally different system. 
Um, and uh, maybe I'll show that how to, well, that's a, a whole other ball game. So maybe I won't even show that system because virtually no other camera manufacturer uses it. So I've written down one over 20, uh, F 1.8, aperture 1.8, and ISO 3200. So I was in my auto mode here with the lightning bolt crossed out. And I'm just going to switch it, hard to see up here, up to manual. Oh, can you see that there? So now I'm in manual. So I'm going to recreate these settings here. Oh my goodness, this is kind of awkward. Where's the... So looking for the command di or dial on the camera here. So just like my Canon, if I... Again, I'm sorry you can't really see this too well. If I turn this, you can see those numbers changing. It goes now 1 over 5, 1 fifth of a second. Right? I want 1 20th of a second, so I go to here. Now I'm at 1 20th of a second, which is what I wrote down on the piece of paper, which is what my camera initially took. Okay. Now I want to go to the, um, I want to change my aperture. So on this Canon, or sorry, Nikon camera on the very top, right, you'll see there's this button, just like on the Canon with a plus and minus, right? I'm going to hold that down. And when I hold that down, instead of the shutter speed changing, the aperture is changing, right? So you see it says F16, keep on changing. I'm going to go all the way down here to 1.8, which is what this camera said before. So now I've got 1 over 20 f 1.8. And how do I turn the ISO on this one? If I remember, I think I press the, okay. So on Nikon, there's usually a little button on the bottom somewhere. It says like uh, has like an I, like the the letter I. I press that, and then it, I can kind of go into all these different modes, right? So then I go up here, I find where it says ISO sensitivity, and then I press OK, and then here's all the different settings. So I actually have a little bit more choices than I did in the Canon camera. What did I say? 3200. All right, so I'm gonna click on there, 3200. And now, uh, and then if I tap out here, I'm, I'm now back into the menu. So now I can see that my camera is set to one over 20 shutter speed, F 1.8. And you pro it's probably hard to see here, but it says ISO 3200 on the side. All right, so now I can then take my camera in manual and take a picture and I'm going to just kind of compare these side by side to turn off all that info right and my framing is a little bit different but these pictures for all intents and purposes have the same exposure the light is the same in both pictures because the settings that I adjusted are exactly the same so again, it's miserable to even show you this on that camera above, but they are virtually the same, right? So I'm gonna turn that off. So, so your task, again, just to repeat myself, is to try to do this as often as possible for Wednesday's class, which will, um, so you, again, usually this would be we would go on for another hour and I would continue this lesson. Um, but I know some people don't have the attention span to sit and, and watch this long on, uh, on a YouTube video. So we're gonna, we're, I'm gonna kind of cut the lesson right here. And then next class, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about what these settings actually are. Because we've just adjusted this, and you're like, okay, this is great. Uh, yeah, I'm on shutter speed 1 over 20. Okay, whatever. Aperture f 1.8, and I like, I don't know what, I don't know why, like, what does this matter? Why, why are you teaching me this stuff, right? I totally get it. At first, 
It doesn't make any sense. Um, but it will. And when we start understanding this is where all of a sudden you start seeing people's minds click. Oh, now, oh, whoa, I can now do all this stuff. So, but the first thing is just how do you, is, is adjusting those settings. That's why I'm kind of being a little intentionally vague right now because I don't want to overwhelm you with the technical stuff. So let's f adjust these settings and you want to be able to find those settings as quickly as possible. What I usually find is is the people that, that actually practice this with their camera and, uh, and you know, all you got to do is, is this maybe five times a day, you know, today, tonight, like before, you know, before bed, just take your camera out, take a photograph of the lamp next to your bed, right? And then reproduce it in manual, right? Or take your dog for a walk, take a couple quick pictures while you're standing there, take a picture of your dog while it's doing its business, right? And take a look at its pained face while it's squeezing something out. And then set it in manual, take the same photograph again. Even if the dog walks off, you'll st so you can still see that the light, the, the amount of light in the picture should be the same, right? And the faster you can do this, it makes everything else we do from here on in that much easier. Because what I'll, I'll say, let's say I'll bring up um, this exposure triangle again. Um, so, starting so next class we're going to kind of finish this initial lesson uh about uh the exposure triangle and so on wednesday we'll talk a lot about iso that's what we're going to investigate that one side of the exposure triangle i'll explain what it is and what it does then next week's class on monday we'll spend the whole class actually monday and wednesday we'll spend the entire time I remember what order I do this in. I, I believe next Monday and Wednesday we'll spend the whole time talking about aperture, um, because aperture that setting is probably one most people may not have heard of. But you definitely have, know what it, that when people adjust the aperture, what it looks like. So I'm going to we're going to spend two classes really talking about it and learning it and. The aperture, probably more than any of the settings on your camera, when you f when you start figuring out what it does to control what's called depth of field, or it gives you that bokeh effect or bokeh, we'll talk about uh, that. Um, that is again where people's minds explode and they say like, whoa, this camera that I was thinking about returning because I thought it was a piece of junk. Wow, it takes beautiful photographs. Wow, it takes photographs 10 times better than my iPhone. And I've had this thing for years just sitting on the shelf and I haven't used it. Whoa, like look how cool. Like This is gonna, it's gonna change your life. So next week, we're gonna, your life will change when you learn about Aperture. And then two weeks from now, we'll spend Monday and Wednesday talking all about shutter speed. So shutter speed is the one that takes really fast photos where a runner's frozen in movement or a bird's wings. Uh, uh, one of the thumbnails for last week's image was a, a photograph I took of an eagle. That's using a very fast shutter speed. So I'll show you how to do that. And a lot of people I know uh, take this class because they want to be able to take photographs of wildlife. So two weeks from now, we'll, we'll spend two hours talking all about that. And then on the last week, so what's that three weeks from now is kind of all of the assorted other things uh, that we'll that are important to learn for kind of this basic photography. We'll talk a little bit more about um, we'll talk about flash. We'll talk about doing some basic photo editing, shooting video, um, and picking up audio with a microphone in here. Of, uh, a whole bunch of other things like that and lighting and all sorts of and just while i'm on the lighting you could see and in, in behind here uh this is this new backdrop i just put up and this miserable this is the iphone so you could even just hear the difference between this iphone that's taking this this video that you see right now and kind of how blown out it is versus this video 
This is coming from the Fuji on a 90 millimeter lens. Um, a really nice, beautiful top of the line camera, right? So two, you can see the quality is remarkably different, right? Um, so, and again, once you, once you know how to use your camera in manual mode and really control it, I want you to get to the point where you're walking around and you're like, oh, so this is really cool. I'm going to take a picture of it. <sighs> I just have my iPhone with me. Even, I've got my iPhone 10X Pro or whatever, you know, Note 6, you know, this $3,000 phone camera in my pocket. But even then, I wish I had my $500 DSLR or mirrorless camera with me. That's the difference. Once you understand how to fully control this camera, you'll you'll never really you, you, your your camera phone, your smartphone will always seem kind of more like the the backup option or like okay, I I can take some okay photographs with this in in comparison, but I wish I had my real camera with me. If that makes any sense. Okay. So, um, it's 5.10 right now. So that, that would be the kind of conclusion of today's lesson. I am going to, however, uh, take a look online here and see if there's some photos that I know people sent. Um, so, I'm going to, how do I, uh, what's the best way to show this? Um, I think there's Instagram. Uh, come on. I'll go to my pull that up real quick. I'm super itchy and sniffly, as I said. I had like allergies. <laughs> Allergy season is like, and then of course when you have uh, this whole other thing going on in the world right now, it makes you super paranoid. <laughs> like, oh gosh, like. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Oh, there's a whole bunch here. wonder how I can... So Yannick sent me some, and I know Marie Elise uh, sent me some too, so... <clears throat> hmm... Go to. Let me pull up what's the best way for me to show these. Um, or Maria Lisa, sorry. So let's see here. So she sent. How can I fill this screen up here? This is why I'm doing things at the end here, where all the fiddliness is um, happening. Okay, so here's uh, the set of three photographs that she sent. Uh, I, Maria was in a, cla or a, a class that I taught at Hootsuite. Um, I was teaching some of the staff at the social media company how to use their cameras. And so here's three new photos. I think she wanted to repeat the class, so I'm glad to see her, her here again and doing a little refresher. Uh, obviously, you know, when, we're, when we were taking classes together, it, uh, things were, were really busy and, um, you know, life takes takes over and it's hard to kind of, um, uh, you know, do, do all this learning while you're, while you're at work. So this is great. Now you got a little bit more time, Maria, to work on this. I'm just switching that view off. Okay. Where do I got to stand here? So that, okay. So here's her three picture stories, which is the, the assignment that I, I gave you guys last week. So yeah, here's would be her establishing shot. All right, so this is where uh, the inter entryway into a public park. All right, let's make this a little bigger to clean it up. 
So we have this view, and then we were inside the park. This is a nice park. Where where is this? Um, uh, wow, it's nice. And then we've got some flowers inside the park. So we've got your establishing shot. Um, I, th I think this is intended to be a medium shot and then a close-up shot. Um, so my, my feedback on these photographs would be that um, I like this. Th this works uh, is, so this is your establishing shot. Like we see the entryway, gateway. We talked about using um, like frames within a picture to help lead people in. And you, you're very literal here. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Like, um, uh, so we have this, we have an archway, an entryway kind of, so this is pulls us into like, this is how, um, uh, Citizen Kane begins. If you've si seen that amazing film from uh, like the 1930s, Orson Welles is a big film. It begins kind of this way. There was like a, an old, um, a mansion with the the gate and where the camera kind of goes through the gate so here's city in the park and then here here's some more information here's about the actual park and we've got the fountain uh now this uh, also feels a little bit like an establishing shot which is not there's no nothing wrong you could do three establishing shots uh, i don't know if she was intending to do um an establishing medium and close-up um this what's nice here is we actually we kind of have let's say your medium shot and an establishing shot all in one photograph because we've got lots of depth in the photograph we have this sign and then we have the fountain in behind so you know because we could also take this photograph without the sign and, and we just see the fountain right here we we're, we're compressing two different ideas in one picture which is great you're, you're being very economical with your your photograph so it's always i think a great photograph is when we see multiple things all in one space right i would say um that this photograph is a little overexposed and that's something we'll talk about um next class so next on wednesday we'll talk about getting a good exposure what does that mean and when things are too bright or too dark so here it looks the the sky is pure white and there's no detail in it and it's also starting to intrude on some of the branches of the trees and the building itself is kind of dissolving into the sky and there's nothing inherently wrong with that if you want that to happen but i imagine you'd want more detail in the sky um and maybe more detail in here so what we would do is darken the photograph, let less light into the camera. And if we think about, um, let me see, is it this here? Right, so if we think, go back to here, all it would be doing is adjusting one of these settings to darken the picture because there's too much light in the picture. So, and I'll talk about which which direction do they go? Does it, do I want this to go from you know, F1.8 to F5, or do I want it to go to F1, or, you know, whoa. That's next class. We'll get into the detail. Um, so this is just a little bit too bright. And then this one's a fabulous photograph. So here now we have you, this, these flowers, nice and juicy, and, you know, there's the dew or rain on them, right, that's glistening in this beautiful sunset that's you know appearing between the buildings and trees uh so this is great and it's also what's nice is you can see that the flowers oh sorry i should go back here sorry um you, you kind of, so i was talking about this these two flowers in the foreground are kind of um nice and ref dewy and and they have that moist quality to them and then the background is a little bit blurry and out of focus which is often what people want um in their their photos oh okay let's uh let's bring uh skip okay let's bring this back up here and to save this i'm gonna put this so I had a battery just die, and that's why. So, 
So we're, the, the battery on the nice camera just died. Um, shooting video like this chews up batteries. Um, so this have to forces me to keep these classes a little bit shorter. So uh, so these look this is great. I, I really like this photo. I think this is your the strongest of the three photographs that you sent, uh, Maria. Um, this one again is is nice. It's just the sky is, is also a little bit overexposed again just like my face is in the video, right? Unfortunately, with that little iPhone, I wasn't able to to darken it the way I wanted. Um, again, another limitation of your phone over a camera. So these kind of nicely tell us, and you can see how simple this project actually is. I think um, maybe I may have explained it and intimidated people feel it's like, oh my God, that's so complicated. How am I gonna do this project? Um, it's, it doesn't require uh, that much effort and to pull off a really good photograph. And thinking about a story in three or a triptych is just a really helpful technique to kind of help uh, um, focus your ideas and also to focus your attention when you're actually doing the project. So I just say, just take three photographs. People just go outside and go, I don't know, what do I, there's a million things. But if it's like, okay, let's, make a simple straightforward photograph where we're kind of maybe just like this zooming into a space and getting closer people find that easier okay so um let's take a look at some of these photographs here and let's i'm just gonna make this even bigger here how do i do that this here, I'm gonna zoom this, zoom here. And let's bring that down here. Okay, so here's Yannick's photos. I wonder if I tap here if it's gonna go to the next one. No, of course not. <laughs> um, so this is beautiful. Look at that gorgeous flower. Um, I don't know enough about the flowers to know anything about what kind of flower this is, but uh, great light. So this looks like uh, a kind of evening or, or morning, that kind of golden hour light where everything has that a little bit of an orangey hue to them, right? Or a golden hue, hence golden hour, right? So um, we have that kind of gold color on all these things and it's just very flattering to the image and the background is out of focus i'll show you how to do all that in the next few uh, episodes um let's see another photo here load that up make it a little bigger um so this one uh I don't think is as strong as the previous one. I mean, I like there's this diagonal, the pathway in here, but then there's just this extraneous stuff of the car and behind. And there's this sort of, there's a lot of busyness in here that might be distracting from the photograph. I mean, that's my personal opinion. I'm just giving you my, my feedback on photographs that you've sent. Um, some people may prefer the other one over the other. But, you know, let me see, we'll jump to the next one. Ooh, beautiful, look at this. Another gorgeous photograph. So, uh, I love these colors. Another great thing about when we're composing pictures is not only um, the composition in terms of, you know, because we've got this, this flower is kind of decentered, right? So rather than being right in the middle, and you can put it a little bit off to the left, uh, or on camera here, it looks like I'm going to the right, but uh, um, so that just kind of now creates some interest in the background. Even though the background's blurry, our mind see like goes, oh, look, this is nice and focused, this is blurry, and there's something kind of nice and dreamy about all of that blurry space here. So this is great, and also, uh, so we have the contrast between blurry and in focus, and that's what Aperture does. So we'll, we're going to be learning all about that shortly. But then we have a contrast between light and dark. 
We have contrast between textures. You know, something can be kind of um, rough looking and smooth looking or shiny and dull. Um, and then we have color contrasts. Like we have these beautiful hot pink here with contrasted all of these greens. Like you imagine if this flower was a bright green, like it's a bud and it was taken in front of all this other green, you might look at the photograph and think, uh, oh, it's a flower. I didn't even see it at first. Or if you're taking a picture of, of a bird, you know, a brown bird sitting in a pile of brown leaves, you know, you'd be like, I don't know, I can't see the bird. And unless the, the, the point is to show the amazing camouflage of that animal so that people look at it and you go, can you see there's actually 30 birds in the photograph? People are, what? Oh, that is neat. Like, wow, that's amazing that bird can camouflage. So what do you want to communicate is what you got to be thinking because if you want to be able to see that bird immediately and it jumps out, then you're going to have to find a different angle so that we don't just have brown surrounding that brown bird. If my analogy holds any water here. Okay. Ooh, yeah, these are great. Great photos. Um, it's nice, this this leaf here with that little white outline that it, it naturally has actually works again really well to separate it from the background. Because um, that's another thing we're always thinking about is separation between foreground and background and middle ground and so forth. Um, so you can see th this green flower, you know, the contrast is it has a little bit more yellow, a little bit more of a lime quality. So it stands out against some of these kind of a little bit darker uh, leaves, darker green leaves anyway. Um, but then the f because the focus is different, one thing is in nice sharp focus versus the background being out of focus, it helps make a separation between the two. Because if they were all in focus, we might just see a big blob of green across here and not know what we're supposed to look at. And part of being a photographer is focusing people's attention. Um, how do we get back out? There we go. Oh, lots of great photos. Um, wow, look at that nice insect. You're, you're doing great. Why are you taking this class, Anik? <laughs> but you, so, you know, these are all, probably photos you're all taking with your, the auto setting of your camera, which is great. Like, you're seeing, the, the, your auto setting your camera is, depending on the camera you have, maybe take, takes better photographs than the auto setting on somebody else's camera. Especially older cameras tend to have poorer auto functions, which is to be expected, right? Just because the technology has, has advanced. Great. Again, nice sharp focus here for the most part on this insect. Background is blurry so that our attention is drawn here, right? And you've got this, again, nice contrast between the yellow or the this kind of yellow green and then the darker green of the grass in behind. And then, oh, you still got lots here. Um, well, I'll go through a few more. Wow, that's beautiful. I love this. This is great. Um, I, what's neat is, again, you can see all this area here that's all blurry. You know, if we just saw that part of the photograph, it would be a really weird image. But it kind of sucks us in what we call leading lines. So all those diagonal or, well, diagonal horizontal lines that are kind of flowing into the picture... They're sucking our attention further and further into, boom, we get into the nice, where it's focused, right? Where the focus is set. And then so, then we look at all, now we're starting to notice the little details in here and these dried up leaves. So that's great. And then after we look at that, then we might go into the background, which is blurry. And then that pulls us back and we get into that cycle. It's a great photograph. You should, you should print that one out. Um... Ooh, cool. So, so, you know, I had no idea what I was looking at in the last photo, and now we see one that gives us much more context. So now we see this, and I love all these, the, the, these leaves, I don't know what kind of plant this is, but these kind of sprouts coming out, maybe leaves out of this plant or fruit or whatever. And then in behind all this dead, uh, dried brown and beige colors so it works really well contrasted to all this nice kind of 
you know, full of life here. Those these reds and uh, pinks and um. So, uh, oh, okay. So, so this actually this works kind of for your three picture story here, right? Because you've kind of got this would be more of an even though this is kind of, uh, for some people, would be your close-up, you're really gone in close, 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 and, and or the other way, we're kind of backing out on this photograph. So now we have a little bit more idea of scale and how big this is. It was great. Like, look at these nice contrasts in this spiky texture um, contrasted to, you know, the dirt in behind, right? Um and just all this is great I, I mean just love all these colors we got this nice green and then we got browns and then blacks and grays this area in behind um is overexposed so there's no information in this white area um i'm not uh it can be a little distracting it's not necessarily a bad thing to have things that are overexposed but um I don't know if it serves this picture as well. So it might have been just a choice of just angling the camera up a little bit more so that, that we would cut this out and we'd see this ground instead. Or conversely getting even lower and then that we might see some, some other kind of leaves in behind. It's kind of tr tricky to say. Or you wait till the sun starts kind of going down and, and isn't so bright. I think you got one more here. And then I'll we'll check and see if anybody else sent anything else. Cool, some graf well, I don't know if it's graffiti or a mural. Cool picture. I don't know who painted that or where that is. Um, this one uh, is, for me, more of just like a document. Uh, like, I could imagine whoever painted this would take this photograph. Like, this doesn't tell us really about where this image necessarily is, which is kind of what I would like to see. I'd like to, instead of taking this picture straight on, what I would suggest is if we got a little bit closer and then we saw more of the alleyway or the side of this building and, you know, is this, you know, is there a dumpster right here and garbage all over the place? Or does this actually on the side of a police building? You know, like all those little details would tell us a lot more about where we are and where this graffiti or where mural is and um so i want to see more of the ground um that's just me personally but if this was a part of a three picture story then it might work as it is and maybe the next photograph would be a super close-up of like the the paint or the drips here and maybe another photograph the establishing shot could be of the alley the, the picture I was, I was describing that i would like to see um Okay, I think we are um, just gonna. I think we're. I don't know if there's any more photos here, and we're, we're definitely uh, gone over time here. It's like five thirty. Um, ah, okay. So Yannick's just commenting on what the difference. It's a peony. Is that how you say that, that flower? Pe peony, and then a gunera. Yeah, well, my pleasure. I am. Uh, uh, your thanks, Yannick, for sending the photographs in. It, it makes for a great discussion. I think um, what I would recommend, if you're you're welcome to send me some photographs uh, and tag them to me on Instagram, uh, Facebook, or um, Twitter, and then I'll give anybody else feedback on your photos, kind of at the end of next class. Um, some people are really nervous about sending photos because they only want to send the very best photos to get feedback on. I actually think the the some of the best photos for you to send are photos where you're where it's not working out, where you've taken photographs that you're not happy with, and then I can help you problem solve why the photo didn't turn out. So if you've got photos that are too dark and you're just like, I don't know why this is happening. Um, then send those to me because then I can help kind of answer why there's some kind of a problem. Um, well, my wife's saying that how do you pronounce it? Peeny. Peeny. Okay. Learn something new. I'm learning while you guys are learning. <laughs> 
Okay, so that, I think, brings us to the end of today. Um, that's great. I, there, there was lots of comments and interactions. Uh, you can do me a great favor by liking this video before you, before you say goodbye. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the little notification bell so you can find out when the next video is coming up. I've also, I'm posting these onto the, onto my Facebook page and onto the Facebook event page too. So um, if you're, and so just those, those are just ways that, you know, you may forget that you've, you've been taking this class. It just reminds you that it's happening because I want to kind of hold you as accountable as I can. I can't see your face right now. Maybe you're sitting in your underwear just eating potato chips or maybe you're frantically writing notes down um, and you're eager to do it, but you know everyone gets busy and we forget what what we're doing. And um, especially in this weird time we're in right now, where time is going fast and slow, and fast and slow, and you know, who knows what's going on. Uh, um, and if you want to be uh, even more uh, supportive and you want to show your appreciation, there's a link in the description to if you want to send a small donation via PayPal. Uh, you could send a dollar or five hundred dollars, however much you feel um, uh, value you got out of the video. It's not required, but uh, it's just a friendly suggestion. And, and I also want to say, Unique um, uh, has been very kind of contributing both both times, both classes. So um, uh, thanks to all the people. There's been quite a lot of people who've actually sent money in. So that's great. Um, I think that's everything. Do the do the little homework that I sent you. You will learn how to use your camera, and when you learn to use your camera, it's like having a superpower, because then you're going to understand so much more, not only about how to take photographs, but you're going to start looking at other people's photographs differently, and that's what's really exciting, is when you're well, it's just it's exciting and also be a little distracting. I know my wife it drives me crazy because we'll be watching some movie and some horror movie. And she's like, "Oh my god, are you terrified?" And I'm like, "Oh, no. I was sorry. I was thinking about how cool that shot was. <laughs> like, I wonder how they did that. Like, how on earth did the camera? Like, anyway, it's it just changes and makes I think for a more richer appreciation of of the images that we're surrounded with all the time when you start becoming curious about how they were created. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, or night, and we'll see you same time, same place on Wednesday. If you're doing the drawing class too, same time, same place tomorrow. Okay, have a great night. Bye-bye. <laughs>